lunch or the cafeteria, I can't remember. And uh, he said, hey, uh, somebody threw it out there and said, hey, what's the, what's the, like, the best pilot tip you've ever heard? I mean, the very best tip you've ever heard, it just stayed with you, it makes you a better pilot, you think about it all the time. Sometimes it comes from a pilot you fly with a lot, you really experienced uh, pilot. Sometimes it comes from an instructor. You know, and so we started throwing out our tips and then naturally arguments ensued about what's the best tip and what's the worst tip and geez, that's the worst tip I've ever heard. And uh, we had a lot of fun with those kind of conversations. And so we thought, you know, this would be a really fun uh, seminar topic. We just sort of, so we threw it out on, we're on Facebook. Um, you, can, you can follow us if you don't, please think about it. Air Safety Institute, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram with AOPA. Uh, we have our own YouTube channel. And last year we had about 6 million uh, accesses of our material, whether it's our videos or our podcasts or whatever. So we do it out on all our channels and said, hey, all you people that you know follow ASI, I think there's something like 20,000 followers or something on, on Facebook. Um, how about, uh, why don't you write into us and tell us what your best tip is? And so we put all those together and then we sort of rack and stack them. And then uh, at the end, you know, we always used to say when I was in the military, he who holds the pins wins the debrief. Yeah. So uh, I held the pins and I won the final list. So, uh, but this gets really fun when you think about, I'm gonna share with you some of the top tips we came up. And if you, if you we, we started this at Oshkosh and we've modified it a little bit because in every audience, somebody will give us a better tip and we go, you know what? That's it, and this one is out. You know, so we, uh, we live and breathe, so it's really fun if you kind of join in the discussion here. So think about that as we go through it. But let me go ahead and start. This has got to be number one, right? This is one of the best pilot tips from the best uh, pilot that's ever flown, and this is from Bob Hoover, who says, fly the aircraft as far into the crash as possible. And this, to me, communicates not just an attitude when you're in distress. To me, it communicates how we fly our airplanes in general, the whole attitude we take towards aviation. And that is, you know, as you know, there are often times where judgment is required, thankfully, right? If judgment weren't required, flying wouldn't be near as much fun. It requires skill, it requires good judgment, and we all take a lot of pride in that. And no matter how much you use those things, there are times when you find yourself in a square corner, either of your own doing, or maybe your aircraft is having problems or whatever the case is. Uh, my friend Dean here brought up a good point in the seminar the other day, and I want to stress that. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter how you got there. Forget about how you got there. It's really unimportant, whether it's your fault or whatever. And it doesn't matter what happens in the future with the FAA and what your spouse thinks and whatever that. None of that matters. Deal with the situation right here, right now. And then worry about, think about how you got there and lessons learned and all that comes later. Focus all your energies on dealing with the situation right now. And this quote from Bob Hoover. If you have a situation, some 90% of all airport landings do not end in a fatality. And I'm convinced the reason that that is is because pilots are flying the aircraft all the way through into the crash as far as possible. The worst thing you can do is give up your options. Even if you have bad options, you choose the worst, you choose the best of the worst options available to you, right? So that you're still you still own your own destiny all the way in and through the crash. So we'll talk a little bit more about some priorities to help make that. But here's a case, we'll talk about this after the video, but Sierra, if we could watch this video real quick. Okay. You'll see an aircraft come from the far right, the right corner of the screen here in a second. So there's a case where Isomati didn't quite fly this thing all the way through the crash because what he wanted to do, he or she, they survived that by the way, was line up on that road, right? right? But they didn't have the ability to do it. So sometimes it's not what you want to do. It's what you have the ability to do. And in my mind, the worst thing you can do is lose it flying airspeed, because if you lose flying airspeed, it doesn't matter what decisions you make or what decisions you want to make, because you can't execute. And that's the case where this person really wanted to line up on that road. What an option. 
right? A better option would have been maybe to float it over the top of those trees and who knows what's over there, but control the crash. Because in that scenario, the one thing that you don't want to do is sudden impact. Sudden impact is what's going to cause fatalities. So when you're in an engine out scenario, uh, old methods did a really good analysis of this, so did Rob Machado. You really only need about 100, 150 feet to dissipate all that energy, and your body can survive the G's of the impact. So in the worst case scenario, all you're looking for is the ability not to have a sudden impact, dissipate that energy over about 150 feet, and you're going to survive it. The people that don't survive, I'm convinced that 10% or so that don't, is they lose control. They don't fly it all the way through the crash, and at the very end, they leave it up to fate. So we think that's the uh, we think that's un undisputably the best pilot ship out there because of all our communities. Here's uh, pilot tip number two, and this came from uh, my friend Joe Brown, uh, the head of Hartzell uh, propellers. And Joe said he flies with his professional pilots a lot, and he was flying with one of them, who shared with him that in every landing. He picks a spot and he tries to land exactly on that spot. It doesn't matter where he's flying, it could be a TBM, it could be a 180, it could be a Super Cub or whatever. And it's not that hard to do. Every time when he comes in, he says, okay, I'm going to land on the center line at the very end of the fixed distance mark or the front side or whatever. And if he misses it just a little bit, left or right or early or late, as he lands and he gets his aircraft under control and you know, he's got it, everything's fine, he just sort of debriefs himself mentally as he's taxiing in. He clears the runway, he's taxiing and he thinks, why did I drift two feet left of the center line on that? Right at the very end, why did I lose that? In this scenario, did it matter? No, it didn't really matter. But one day it could. One day it could be that he needs to put that airplane exactly where he wants to put it. I think all of us learned that as we grew with CFIs, right? We learned that what's so important about flying airplanes is our ability to control our airplane and put it exactly where we want it at all times. And if we can't do that, why couldn't we do it? Did a little bit of drift. I used to, uh, I used to have this issue, and for now I solved it. It may, came, it may come back where right in the flare, I would just drift a little bit left every time. It would be like two or three feet left of the center line. And if my brother was flying with me, he flies for UPS, he would always mumble loudly, the center line is reserved for professionals. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got to think about that. I thought, you know, as a bare minimum, I'm going to try to land on the center line. And uh, I have a super cup for a while. And so I try to land that super cup in gusty winds or whatever, right exactly on the center line. If I couldn't do that, it might be. Am I pulling a little bit too back on the stick? Am I releasing that aileron a little bit to allow the drift right as I'm touching down? Um, and the answer was yes, that's what I was doing. And a lot of a lot of students do that. They're so focused on the pitch and settling down and making a per perfect touchdown that they drop that drift control and the aileron control out of the posture. So for now, I've solved that problem. In a month or so, we'll see if, we'll see if I still have it. Here's a case where um, some people might want to focus on this same uh, this this same tip. I may need to get you away So pick a spot to land on every landing, hit it, and then if you miss it, even by a couple feet, debrief yourself. I missed that. 
Pilot tip number three, a short essential checklist right before you take off. And I was just listening to the kings up here, the icons of, of our industry. And they were talking about you know all the acronyms that we all use and how there's a plethora of them. And I think what's key is pick one that works for you. But I was talking to uh, the AOPA president and CEO, Mark Baker. He flies a lot of different airplanes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Citations and uh, Super Cubs and 185s and Barons and, and any, any given day, they'll fly two or three different airplanes. And so I was asking him one time, how do you, you know, retractable gear, fixed gear, complex, not complex, how do you keep all that stuff straight in your mind, you know, besides a, a checklist? And he's the one that shared this with me, fuel fire flight controls on any airplane he flies. After his checklists are all done, he's quick for takeoff, he's taking the runway, fuel fire flight controls, one last check. Is his fuel on, mixture set appropriately, you know, the right tanks and all that. Um, is it, are max on both, and are his flight controls clear and his flaps are set? That simple thing. And I picked that up and I use it in my Navion. I use it uh, when I fly the Super Cub. I've just done it and caught myself on a couple different times not having something made exactly where I wanted it. This is the case here. I think this was a uh, Gulfstream jet that was flying out of a uh, uh, Hanscom uh, area up in New England. And uh, they left the gust lock on uh, for takeoff. And um, if they had done that quick thing there, fuel fire flight controls, they'd have realized that they couldn't maneuver the flight controls freely. And they'd have realized their gust lock was in. This Now, this is a tricky kind of a gust lock in the, in the Gulf Stream. But nonetheless, they would have noticed they didn't have a full flight control authority. And how many times have we all been there? You think you're in so big of a hurry that you can't do a quick flight control check just to make sure they're sort of free and clear and correct. So um, I picked that up, I use it as a backup, I don't use it as my primary checklist, I just use it as a backup. Whenever I clear myself for takeoff in a non-tower field or tower field, I'm taking the runway, fuel, fire, flight controls, good to go. It would have saved these guys and saved their passengers. Here's a good tip from our friends uh, at Pilot Workshops. Um, and so, how many people have ever, I know you guys are, you're, you're flying around, you either see the traffic on your ADSB, or you get some traffic inbound from, uh, from your in flight following, right? And they will say, uh, hey, you got traffic at five miles, right to a clock, a thousand feet above or below. Now, if you were to watch most people, because after I read this tip, I've kind of been paying attention to when I fly with people. Most people, when they look at that, if it's above, they look like this, right? They'll look way higher than the traffic uh, typically is. If it's low, they'll look way lower than it typically is. Well, the way sort of curvature of the Earth works, if we're below 10,000 feet, your finger outstretched, you know, as far as you can stretch it, is about two degrees-ish, right? Obviously, this is, this is kind of a wag. So uh, the horizon, out, out uh, as you look out, it's not, that's not actually level flight for you. Level flight, level to you, is about a finger width above the horizon. So if you take your fingers and you put, you know, your, your three fingers and you put the horizon in between your bottom and your second finger, then anything uh, within a thousand feet or so that's going to be a conflict is going to be underneath your top finger if they're high, or underneath your bottom finger if they're low. If they're level with you, they're going to be under, underneath that middle finger. Right? And so on the way down here, I have a lot of traffic coming in the summit from that. I was trying that every time, right? And it's really uh, amazing how it's really close. So traffic falls out, you put your three fingers over there, put a, your horizon between the second and third finger, and then if you move that away, your traffic's going to be in that small area, right in that uh, right in that vertical horizon. Now you may have to, you know, the two or three o'clock is always, as you know, a lot of times that's delayed, so they, they might be different than that. Um, but down the line, you hate traffic that's going to be a conflict to you will be within that three finger width all the way inbound. Pilot tip number five. Use only as much force as necessary to put the airplane where you want it, but use every bit as much force as necessary to do so. So I'm curious, vintage airplane uh, pilots in here, like uh, Super Cubs or anything like that, tailwheel pilots? How about tailwheels? Okay, yeah. So as I mentioned, I was teaching my daughter to fly uh, this summer in our Super Cub, and naturally I taught her like we all learned that hey, airplanes, you don't need to wrestle airplanes. Nobody wants to be a ham fist, right? You can most of the time trim your airplane up and move it with about two to three fingers on the stick in the Super Cub or the yoke or whatever. And you want to be able to do that as a good pilot. The trick is 
small incremental, a lot of small incremental changes rather than late big changes, right? That's the key to being a nice smooth pilot for people that we're flying with. It's really the key to flying good formation. So uh, most of the time that's how we fly our airplanes. But what I, and she picked up on that very, very quickly, right? But what I learned was when we come down into the pattern, whenever I uh, teach tailwheel flying, I always do a drift exercise. So the first pattern that we'll do, I have them come down and slow load the runway, slow flight, flare, but don't touch down that, just a touch of power. So you're doing about in a super cup, 60 miles an hour or so. And then I'll have them drift to the right center of the runway and stabilize and align the fuselage. And now drift to the left center of the runway and stabilize and align the fuselage. And you drift back and forth along the, along the runway. And what I'm trying to teach them is it's basically slow flight, right? But most of the time we do slow flight up at altitude. This is slow flight up over the runway, and it's teaching them your aircraft to slow down. It takes a lot more maneuverability of your A-line control and your rudders to put the airplane exactly where you want. So in tailwheels, especially if you start flying vintage tailwheels, you know, uh, or even airplanes, there are times when you feel like you're having to wrestle this airplane to put it where you want, especially if the winds are a little gusty, you're coming in, and you got some gusty winds you're dealing with, and maybe it's a short one when you really need to get this thing on the ground. That's not the time for the three fingers on the yoke, right? There are times when you're you're honking that thing around there. Sometimes in the Navy, it's a heavy airplane. There's sometimes when I'm really maneuvering that yoke in gusty winds to keep the fuselage aligned and land correctly. So three fingers, light touch, yeah, most of the time. But we got to be willing to wrestle the airplane if necessary to put it exactly where we want. And when you're at slow speed. You really don't have any worry about exceeding your control authority or bending the airplane or anything like that. It's all about getting enough control movement to put the airplane where you want. Pilot tip, tip, pilot tip number six comes from my time with the Thunderbirds. We had this rule where uh, we called it kind of the three strikes and you're out rule. And the way it worked is whenever we found ourselves doing three or, or uh, executing three like mental mistakes that by themselves weren't that much of a problem, but collectively kind of maybe taught us that maybe we're fatigued and we don't realize it, maybe we're distracted and we don't realize it, our head's not in the game. And so if we had three of these different scenarios or you know, uh, errors that we make, we knock it off and back to base. And I can tell you, my two years with the Thunderbirds, maybe through that profile, gosh, I don't know, 300 times or more, probably three or four times, you know, maybe five times, we we use this uh, we use this rule of thumb. And so, for example, we go out on the practice range, and um, my job as lead is to make sure you put the formation in the right place at the right time, right speed, right altitude, in a smooth manner where the guys can fly formation. So I'd come over the range and maybe um, I would call the wrong altimeter setting, right? And that was very important to us, obviously, so I would relay the altimeter setting to our range safety officer. And he'd correct him, so now it's, it's, it's not whatever, it's 3002 or whatever, okay? Uh, well, that's a mental mistake, because the altimeter setting is very important when you're flying low altitude or back. Okay, 3002 set, we're all corrected. Now let's say we come around and maybe I call the wrong maneuver. Obviously, it's, it's really important to do these maneuvers in sequence, and I always had a backup. So if I called the maneuver, the wingman would it would respond with my, my left wingman would respond with his call sign. That call sign told me it is the right maneuver, we're in the right sequence, press ahead. But if it was ever wrong, he would correct me and say wrong maneuver. Um, that'd be like a mental mistake number two, right? And um, a third time might be. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe we pull off the shear line too early, or uh, or maybe I'm expecting a solo in the wrong place, so I make the call to a solo. And none of those by themselves are critical because we had backup. But all those together would say, hey, Lee's head's not in the game today, right? Let's just knock it off and come back another day. How that transitions to uh, to a GA flight, I'll share with you. I came down to do some hurricane relief for Irma. I think what was that about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and we were flying out of here, out of Lakeland. And uh, we were doing kind of a milk run. We'd run from Lakeland uh, to Homestead, and then from Homestead we'd run down to uh, Summerlin Key, and then we'd come back. Um, and after about four days, we were doing three or four sorties of days, um, and we were camping out here uh, for a couple of days. You know, I was pretty tired and didn't realize it. But I cranked up my name on, 
And I just started taxiing out. And I'm taxiing out uh, down the runway, I think it was nine. And uh, the tower says, hey, uh, maybe I'm one in kilo. We kind of like people to call for taxi clearance, you know, before they go. And holy smokes, you know, I had, had ages written down and the identifier and all that. I didn't call anybody. So, okay, I apologize for Pusey and they were good sports about it. So I go down the runway and uh, I'm sitting at the end of the runway and uh, I'm doing, I'm about ready to take off. And I realized that my uh, lap belly didn't uh, snap, right? And I think that's in my checklist like two or three times when I get in before taxi. So I missed that twice in my, in my checklist. So that's like mental mistake number two. So I'm thinking to myself, one more of those kind of things, and clearly I'm just not in the right mindset to fly this mission today. And on that particular case, I didn't, so I went out and flew and did fine, but I was really on alert for the possibility that my head really wasn't as much in the game as it should have been. So think about that, uh, think about that three strikes rule and how it might, uh, how it might work for you. Here's another uh, flying tip uh, that we came up with, and this is kind of a variation on uh, the old a Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, but a little more in depth. And this one is uh, one I'll share with you, and then I'll share with you a video of, of uh, sort of how this one came about. But this, the, the foundation of this, again, was with my time with the Thunderbirds. And um, what I learned as a flight lead was the most important thing I could do was, well, let me share with you the story first. We were somewhere in Louisiana. And if you watch the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels, the difference in those two shows, the, the fantastic shows, I love the blue shows, we have a great relationship with those guys. We do have a healthy rivalry and kind of get to each other and have a lot of fun. But um, one of the primary differences is uh, the Thunderbirds have a lot in front of the audience, no more than 30 seconds from smoke off from one maneuver to smoke on to one, the next maneuver and we're done in 32 minutes. And we were trying to see, could we condense that and do it in 30 minutes? Could we move it so fast that we always had somebody in front of the crowd that we could do a 30 minute show? That was, that was, we were really working hard to do that. But somewhere over Louisiana, we did that. And I was so focused on the timing of the show that I missed some of the other priorities when we landed and the women were just worn out and they were like, good Lord, you know, that, that was rough on us. You were maneuvering without being you know, predictable. You were maneuvering before making the calls just slightly early, which is very tough on the wing when they're flying you. So I was like, uh, man, I gotta, I gotta rethink this. It really impacted me. And so I started thinking, what should my priorities be as a, as a flight lead for this environment? High speed, low altitude formation aerobatics. About number one, flying airspeed. Number two, a clear flight path. I gotta keep flying airspeed and a clear flight path and that keeps the formation safe. And then number three, I gotta be predictable. Because if you're flying in formation and you're predictable, your wingman can stay with you through the lot. So now, after I'm predictable, so flying there's being a clear flight path, I'm predictable. Now I can work on being smooth. And then I can work on the timing. Only after that, once I get all that done, then I've earned the right working up that ladder to work on the timing. So I called the guys in, I told them, you know, I thought about this, and this was the priority that I was going to go after. So from then on, that's the priority that was in my mind every time I flew that formation. I started thinking about, well, how, how would that work in GA? So I had some conversations with some, some colleagues I respect a lot. And this is sort of what we came up to. You know, which is, again, flying airspeed, because if you don't have flying airspeed, it doesn't matter what decisions you make, you can't make them. You're going to lose control of your airplane. A clear flight path, and then put your airplane in the right position in the sky, meaning get in the right airspace. If you're in class Bravo, exit it. You know, if you're heading towards class Charlie without the clearance, turn around, do whatever it takes to, to get your airplane in the right airspace. Then work on your communication. Uh, like tell the center and then what you're doing, whoever you're talking to, or a tower. And then finally, once you do all that, then you've earned the right to put your head down and work all of these fancy avionics that we're using now to put inside our airplanes, right? They take so much time and so much heads down. On the one hand, they're so very powerful in the right time. At the wrong time, they're literally dead. You can put your head inside the cockpit working on this and looking at your iPad down on your knee or whatever, when you really don't need that. You haven't, you haven't earned the right to do that yet. So think about that. Think about earning the right 
to put your head down and work all the avionics that are, that are inside your cockpit, or the ADS-BN solution, or whatever it is that, that, uh, that fancy gadgets that you're buying here at Sunbuck. Here's a, I'll show you this video here, and this is the uh, one of the maneuvers that sort of brought that to bear. This, this is a particularly difficult maneuver to fly. So what you're seeing is the slots video. So that's uh, my airplane out front. We're in trail, we just moved to diamond. Very dynamic maneuver. It is absolutely critical in that trail formation when the lead calls pull. He doesn't pull before that or after that. And he calls nose coming in. On the in and nose coming up, everybody's pulling together. Have to. Otherwise, you're getting an accordion effect and real dangerous. But back to the priorities that I mentioned. If your priority is on timing instead of being predictable and smooth, then this becomes a real problem. And it did that day that I mentioned to you. So, by the way, I'll show you a little, I'll, I'll share with you a little tip. Watch the blue angels today. Watch the trail formation like that. I'll come overhead and trail, then they'll move to diamond. That trail formation is the most difficult thing to fly. It's hard to do early in the season, which they are, and it gives you an indication when you're watching them how the team's progressing. So watch the trail formation. <laughs> and then tell them that you're proud of them because they have scraps and clawed their way to be the second best jet team in the <laughs> <laughs> Tip number eight, use a water bottle to determine uh, cloud clearances. So how many people have flown uh, VFR and you're flight following, you don't want to bother anybody for an altitude change, or maybe you're, you're, there's no turbulence where you are, you're just all set, you're all kind of set, you don't want to move it. And here's some clouds out in the distance and you're wondering to yourself, can I clear this cloud or not, right? Every, every trip, right? especially if you fly a lot in Florida. Um, and you think, I have to climb over that, do I have to descend below it? Here's a really good rule of thumb. And this comes from uh, my colleague, Dave Person. He's the first one that told me about this at AOPA. The first time he told me about this, he said, well, what you do is you take a water bottle and pour it up there, and I'm like, that. <laughs> and uh, so he said, oh, I'll try it. So sure enough, I took it up there. Now, I was giving this uh, seminar, I think, you know, at, at some other place. And after this, somebody came up and said, I said, just take a few sips out of your water bottle and put it up there. And they came up and said, how many sips you got to take out of the water bottle? <laughs> 13, exactly 13. <laughs> so it doesn't matter, right? Take about a third of the bottle, get a clear place. And then again, remember the your level flight is about a finger width above the horizon, right? So put that line about, right, a finger width above the horizon. If the clouds are above the water, you're not going to clear them. If they're below the water, you're clear them. It's been really helpful. Works with Scott. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, and, and he's wearing an air safety institute. Right? <laughs> okay. You've got to use one finger. Well, yeah, so one finger, finger, finger gives you an approximation of what level flight is. One finger width above the horizon is where, where your level flight path is. That water line has to be. Yeah, one finger width above the horizon. Yeah. Um, Here's a good tip as well, and I'll play a video to do this. You know, if you ever had an inch and out scenario, um, first thing that we're taught right is establish your best block, right? And most of the time it's going to happen almost, you know, most of the time you're going to be pitch enough to do that. Except if you're right after takeoff and you're relatively slow when that happens, and if you fly a heavy airplane like a Navy on, you lose power on takeoff. I don't care what your speed is, you're pitching down because that thing will slow down so fast. Um, so anyway, you're at a uh, relatively high airspeed, you're pitching to capture your best flight, and now you're looking for your best landing spot. Well, since you don't want to be heads inside looking at stuff, you'd rather be outside looking, a really good approximation, and this is easier than uh, high wing and low wing, but it works in low wing, is establish a level 